from the opinion pages of the Wall Street Journal. This is Free Expression with Jerry Baker. Hello and welcome to the Free Expression podcast with me, Jerry Baker from the Wall Street Journal opinion page. If you're not already a subscriber to Free Expression, please do sign up wherever you get your podcasts. This week, is America facing a spiritual crisis? As more and more Americans say that religion, in the traditional sense, is not important in their lives, what are the implications for a nation founded under God? Is the decline in traditional religious observance a big reason for the increasingly dystopian state of our social and civic life? Or is the ascent of reason over faith something that should be welcomed? Are other so-called secular religions, such as the passion for environmentalism and the green movement, and the modern creed of social justice, are they replacing traditional faiths, especially for younger Americans? I want me to discuss the state of faith in America, and also to look in particular at the condition of the Catholic Church, is Timothy Cardinal Dolan the Archbishop of New York. Cardinal Dolan was ordained priest almost 50 years ago and has served as bishop in St. Louis and Milwaukee. In 2009, he was appointed Archbishop of New York by Pope Benedict XVI. Three years later, he became a cardinal and then participated in the papal conclave that elected Francis as Pope in 2013. He's the author of several books, including Call to be Holy and To Whom Shall We Go? Lessons from the Apostle Peter. His Eminence Cardinal Timothy Dolan joins me now. Good to be with you, Jerry. I appreciate your invitation. I want to talk to you about lots of things, obviously, but let's start off with looking at kind of the state of America today, Uh if you may. Now, the Wall Street Journal had a poll a couple of months ago, which we do over a long period of time. And this poll asked people about values and the importance of certain values to them. And what it found was that faith in certain values or or belief in the, the importance of certain values has declined dramatically. One of them is religion. In 1998, 62% of Americans said that religion was very important to them. In this latest poll a few months ago, 39% said that. So a really sharp decline. Other values were down to patriotism. So let me start by asking you, Carl, among America's many other problems, is there a spiritual crisis in America right now? You bet there is. Had you asked me on that poll, I would have said the same thing. Yeah, religious values, the steadiness and the dependence upon faith and moral conviction is declining. And for me, no surprise at all, that's a a very toxic development. And I often say, because Jerry, see, the people will say to me over and over again, Cardinal Dolan, what's wrong? What's going on? We got violence. We got crime. We got mass shootings. We got drugs. We got suicide. We've got war. Will you name it? A litany of woes. And I said, Look, you're asking a guy who's going to say what's wrong is that we've forgotten about God. And if we don't have just that moral center to our lives, where we just know innately that certain things are right, certain things are wrong, and that our value, our identity comes from the Lord, it's a given to us. It's not something we pick and choose. It's given to us. And that God himself has kind of instilled within us a sense of moral direction, a sense of moral direction. Pope Benedict XVI used to say that God has instilled into the human person an innate sense of oughtness, oughtness, that we know there are things we ought to do. We know there are things we ought not to do. Those are not subjective Jerry. They don't depend upon us and our opinions. They don't even depend upon the editorial page of the New York Times, or forgive me, the Wall Street Journal. They depend on what God has revealed to us, even for those who might not belong to a particular creed. We would still believe, the great philosophers would say, still ingrained in the human person. We call it the natural law, as you know, ingrained in the human person is the ability to know right and wrong and the ability to know we're not the center of the universe. God is. First comes the Lord, then other people, then ourselves. We got it upside down now. That trifecta has been reversed. To me, when you point out these sobering polls, which I have to say, as much as I'm distressed by them, I'm afraid they're right in the numbers because I sense it myself anecdotally. Don't ask me what's wrong with the world. That's what's wrong with the world. Another way of looking at it, you're absolutely right. This human 
longing for or belief in a moral obligation is still there, but it's kind of taking other forms. Don't you think that to some extent the traditional religion, whether it be Christian, Catholic, Jewish, Muslim, the great Abrahamic faiths, or indeed other traditional religions, while they may be in decline, people are seeking this sort of moral authority or these moral obligations in other areas. I mean, the, the, the whole you know, environmentalism, yep. uh, you know, or I hate to use this term because it's overused, but the sort of woke stuff, the kind of the sense of social justice and these things that really animate so many people right now have be- become in a sense, haven't they, for many people, a kind of an alternative to traditional religion. I'm afraid you're right. You know, St. Augustine, who was one of the greatest thinkers around, he said, even those who say they no longer believe in God, they have to have a God with a small g. Now, most of the time, that's the person who looks back at us in the mirror in the morning. We make ourselves gods. But we will begin to construct other values that take the place of the classical, religious, biblical, revealed, natural law values. Most of the time, they're of our own liking. But you are correct. Think of the philosophy today in our culture, the name under which we usually group sort of an antagonism towards religion. We use the word secularism, okay? So secularism is kind of a dime definition, is our preference to get along just fine without God. Well, we make secularism becomes religion. Secularism, what they tell us, especially in their criticism of the traditional religions, they take on an infallibility. They take on a moral superiority. They have their doctrines. They have their dogmas. They have their moral imperatives. And in many ways, they're more rigid than those of the classical religions. So you're right on target. It's not that we go through life without a God. We have a God of our own making. And that's where trouble comes in. See, there is one true God. And once we lose sight of the one true God, we're in trouble. So why do you think people have lost sight of that? Again, other data that we have shows that, I think for the first time ever, a recent Gallup poll, I think it was, showed that fewer than half of Americans regularly go to church. It's about 30%. You know, whereas again, 50 years ago... It was up in the 70%. 60, 70%. Yeah. What's happened? Well, I would say, unfortunately, we as human beings are swayed by what we see around us, okay? For the good and for the bad. Now, it's interesting. So we usually call that culture, okay? So this would be, as anthropologists define culture, the things that most influence us besides our DNA, besides our blood. In other words, what we inherit from without. And culture, especially in the United States, I am somewhat well-versed in the United States because my own study in American religious history, America has always looked upon religion and faith, our culture, in a benevolent way. So usually in American culture, there is at worst, a neutral view towards religion, at best, a benign view towards religion. You know, George Washington said, this grand experiment in democracy cannot prevail without the role of religion. Right. Probably the most astute commentator on American political life, Alexis de Tocqueville. Remember yeah. in the 1830s, we still consult him. He said, what will prevent this democracy, which they looked down upon in post-revolution France, what will stop this democracy from descending into mob rule? He said, I have great faith that it will not because there's great faith among the American people. The role of what he called the voluntary associations, first of which he listed as family, but then secondly, religion and faith. He said, so as long as religion and faith remain strong in America, as long as these voluntary associations like family, like home, like neighborhood, like work, like organizations to which one might belong freely, as long as they thrive in America, as long as they are the ones kind of salting the culture, we'll be all right. My point, Jerry, in in response to your question is, now culture is the other way around. Now culture, I'm not talking about all of culture, but I'm talking about what? I'm talking about universities. Mm. I'm talking about press and company excluded media. I'm talking about politics. I'm talking about social movements. Now they look down upon religion. Religion and faith 
are less than helpful, if not downright detrimental to a vigorous culture. So look, when I grew up, and I know the 1950s were not this nostalgic, uh, uh, idyllic time, but I look back very often and I think, what were the major influences on my life growing up? They were soft, they were discreet, they were gentle. It certainly was my mom and dad and grandparents and my family. It certainly was my neighborhood, and it certainly was my Catholic faith. It was not oppressive. It was joyful. It was warm. It was tender. It was my Catholic grade school. It was the gentle influence of the priests and the sisters. It was my education. It was the majority of my friends who shared my faith. That was the culture with which I grew up. As I look to my nieces and nephews now whom I love, that ain't the major influence on their life. What is? Technology, social media, their phone, yeah. social media, the movies, and those things are antagonistic towards traditional faith and virtue. You know, there's a view among some modern conservative thinkers that this is a crisis, the decline in the importance of these institutions, family, faith, the sort of traditional values that you just described growing up in the 50s and 60s. I did too. I grew up in England, but similar institutions and values that we had, that actually the crisis is a crisis of liberalism itself. You know, that this is what you get when you elevate liberalism, when the pursuit of freedom for its own sake becomes the defining value of society, that when we used to cling to traditional values, we used to have authority figures, whether it was the church or family, again, things like that. But instead, this is a crisis and whether it's a decline in faith, in traditional religious faith, in the breakdown of the family, the alienation that so many people feel in communities where traditional sort of economic activities have disappeared. Is this a crisis of the liberalism that we've elevated so much that we've come to see as so central to our lives? Do you think maybe there's something in this argument that maybe we need to return to a more traditional sort of authority-based structure rather than the accent on sort of extreme freedom and extreme liberalism that we've come to worship almost? You're going to be proud because I'm going to quote another Englishman here, okay? St. John Henry Cardinal Newman. Of course, yeah. Uh, Very well indeed, yeah. A towering intellect, a convert from Anglicanism towards Catholicism. And he said in the mid-19th century, what, what he would say is the most stinging threat to civility and to democracy is what he called philosophical liberalism, which he defined as the denial of any objective truth. Truth is now subjective. Truth is what I decide. Truth is what I say it is, okay? So you're parroting Newman, and well done, because, boy, if we're going to parrot somebody. It's great to parrot Cardinal Newman. But he said the same thing. Now, it's interesting. We got to be careful about that word liberal, because when you use it kind of in a European term of democratic liberalism, that was kind of a good thing. So the great leaders after the Second World War, Adenauer, Gaspari, they would always talk about Christian democracy that a democracy that is infused with biblical values, a democracy that places a high role on virtue and moral imperative, that's the only way a democracy can survive. So that's kind of a good branding of a democratic liberalism. But I'm afraid that's gone into the dustbin because now we don't need just faith leaders to say this. Uh, Psychiatrists, historians, doctors, sociologists will say this. We have a wrong perception of freedom. We believe that freedom is our absolute right and entitlement to do anything, anytime, anywhere with any person that we want. Okay? Pope St. John Paul II said it well. He said, genuine freedom is not the license to do whatever we want but the liberty to do what we ought. That's the proper understanding of freedom. And I would maintain that's the American understanding of freedom. We don't speak about freedom without the sequel words of responsibility, diligence, duty, okay? These are virtues that flow from uh, from the proper understanding of freedom, which while not limited to traditional religion, sure spices it. Part of the genius that many people have said for years of the American system, say in in contrast with Europe, and you've talked about European Christian democracy, is that obviously the very strict separation of church and state in America, very different from what we've ever had in Europe. It was that that kind of enabled 
religion to thrive because it wasn't established, it wasn't associated yep. with political authority in the way that it was in Europe. But again, why is that no longer seem to be such a virtue of the American system? Why is, is the, again, the very strict sort of secular state that you have, the secular politics that we have here in America, why is that, again, why does that seem to be now fostering this kind of turn away from faith and religion? You know, Benedict XVI, and he got people doing a, a double take, he said, you know, we usually decry a secularism but secularism is a very positive thing for the practice of the faith. And within secularism would be that belief in the separation of church and state. There's nothing freer than religious assent. And all we ask is to grow up in a society that protects that ability to search for, find, and give religious assent. This experiment in democracy, the United States of America, has enshrined that. It's the first of our Bill of Rights, okay, the freedom of religion. And while existing, so you got this caricature of separation of church and state being secularism and steroids. No, it's actually medicinal, therapeutic, and encouraging to religion, as we would know. Pardon me for pointing to Europe, but you see those ancient countries where there was a union of throne and altar are us where there was a that where culture and faith were synonymous like Ireland okay there the church is in great decline here in the united states since our inception well we sure got our wheelbarrow full of problems we're vibrant okay religion traditionally thrives because we're at our best when we're free from the fetters that government would impose. The constitutional historians say when that freedom of religion uh, given by the fathers in the Constitution, they would say that's to protect the church from governmental intrusion, not to protect the government from religious. They need religious influence. They don't need religious interference. They don't need religious oppression. They don't need religious dictates, but they do need a democracy that is filled with virtuous, thinking, responsible people who have religious convictions at their core. So thanks for bringing it up, because, you know, the idea of this American experience, the separation of church and state, freedom of religion, that didn't sit well mm. in Europe. Rome didn't like it. No. Poor Cardinal Gibbons, the Archbishop of Baltimore, when he went to Rome to get his red hat, he was stung at his uh, titular church, Santa Maria in Trastevere. He praised, he said, I come from a country that is grateful for our constitutional construction of freedom of religion and separation of church and state. Those in Rome did not look kindly on that. Ah, they recovered their senses at the Second Vatican Council in the document on religious freedom. That was the most vigorous proponents of that were the American bishops, where freedom of religion and separation of church and state was decreed by the church to be a good thing. So what happens? You got now a caricature of whenever religion and faith is strong, the danger is a theocracy a fanatical theocracy, baloney. When it's not strong, you've got the danger of an oppression from the secularists. We're going to take a short break there, but when we come back, I'll have more with Archbishop Cardinal Dolan. We're talking about the state of faith in America. Stay with us. You're listening to Free Expression with Jerry Baker. Don't forget, you can listen to the latest episode anytime on your smart speaker. Just say, play the Opinion Free Expression podcast. Now, back to Jerry Baker. I'm back with Timothy, Cardinal Dolan, Archbishop of New York. We're talking about the state of faith in America. We're also looking at American politics and the role that Catholics and the Catholic Church play in it. Now, but let's talk about the church itself, if we may, for a moment. The Catholic Church. Sure. And the church has obviously been through some trials, should we say, in the last 20 years or so, then there've been some terrible scandals involving yep. the behavior of priests and the way in which it was treated and handled and cover up, not just in this country, but around the world, but obviously it's been particularly noticeable in this country. To what extent has that episode and the church's very, very, very delayed response to it and failure, actually, and let's be honest, in the, in the early stages to deal with it, the problem of child sex, sex mm -hmm. abuse and all of that, what extent has that played a role in undermining people's faith in the Catholic Church and perhaps even to some extent yep. in, in organized religion generally. Yep. How important has that episode been? 
mightily important, big, big time important. So I will always say, look, while we believers of all faiths are uh, bemoaning the decline in religion, we also have to admit, Lord knows we've sure done our share to give people reasons to reject it. Okay, even look outside the United States, even look worldwide where you see religious fanatics who are the cause of violence and war, assassinations. Okay, look here where you see the terrible scandals, uh, sexual, financial, you bring it on. We are part to blame for people no longer seeking solace and direction in the church because we've shown ourselves to be a very uncertain trumpet and a very unreliable guides. Now, Jesus even knew that in his days when he was pointing to the religious leaders and he said, Psst, follow what they say, but don't do what they do. So even he knew back then that there was a shocking side of religion. There was hypocrisy. There was scandal. He's constantly wanting to cleanse us of that. Okay. So I'm always amazed though, at the resilience of our Catholic people who, yeah, they will readily say they've been reduced to tears and anger over some of the things they hear about the church. But then they'll come right back and say, but we know that's not the church that we love. We know that would be very minority exceptions, and we're not going to let the scandalous behavior of anybody in the church rob us of the religious values that give meaning and direction in our lives. They might not articulate it like that, but they will constantly tell me that. So you see, because our faith is not based in an institution, it's not based on a a human being, okay? It's based on God. And for us, as Christians and Catholics, God, who became incarnate in his only begotten Son, and who is alive and powerful today in the Holy Spirit, our faith is in that person, God, not in anything, any human part of the church, as important as that is. Mm. Can we talk about the papacy? Pope Francis has been Pope now for— A little over 10 years, yeah. In my adult lifetime, I'm pretty much in your adult lifetime, we've had four popes, of course, including, sadly, the very brief reign of Uh John Paul I. John Paul II— this extraordinary evangelizing messianic figure transformed, played an enormously important political role, as well as, I think, sort of, you know, again, re reemphasizing the sort of, we might call the core values of the church after the disputes after Vatican II and all of that. An extraordinary figure. Then obviously we had Benedict, who was very much, you know, in the mold of John Paul II, I think people would say. Right. Th- theologically speaking, obviously didn't have the same personality, the same character. And then we've had Pope Francis for yep, 10 yep. years. And Francis, from all what we've seen of him, is a different figure from I those two. Right. I hate using political yeah. terms to describe right. popes, but he's generally seen as a kind of a more liberal on some of these sort of traditional teachings around marriage and sex and all of these things. How do you assess his papacy and, and where he's moved the church in the course of the last 10 years? Well, thanks for asking. He's a prodigious figure, and you won't be surprised to hear me say I love him very much and appreciate what he's done. But you are right. He's different. He's something, someone that we haven't been used to. And that's not a bad thing. Now, kind of the ready answer that we would always give is that the style of popes, the way they teach, can differ big time. What they teach doesn't. You just made a great point, say, in some sexual issues, Francis is thought of as liberal as much as you and I might not depend on those uh, clichéist terms. But what he says is about as traditional as you can get, okay? How he says it is a bit softer, a little bit more presentable, a bit more gentle and amiable than people perceived as predecessors as saying it. So it's usually the style. And in his style, there's no doubt about it. He would be much more gentle, much more open to some of the trends, much uh, less reluctant to kind of very assertively condemn things while still strongly. I mean, you can't They say, oh, you know, he doesn't talk about abortion. Well, I don't, for all their charismatic pro-life stances of John Paul II and Benedict XVI, I don't think they would have said what Francis does, 
Aborting as a baby is like hiring an assassin to kill somebody that's inconvenient to you. That's pretty strong stuff, okay? So, but yet in his openness uh, to the needs of women, in his kind of stress on the fact that we have an obligation not only to the innocent baby in the womb, but to the struggling woman who's trying her best to carry that baby and bring it to full life, he is a little different. I have a little kind of catch when people, so I, I kind of think, well, I'm trying to figure it out. I'm saying, you know, here, in my book, John Paul II was strong in the life of the soul. We have to recapture the vitality of faith the poignancy of belief and trust. Benedict, of course, was strong on the mind, the intellectual wattage of the church. Francis is strong in the heart. In those days prior to the conclave, as you know, I can't talk about the conclave, although apparently many people have, (laughs) because there's enough (laughs) books about it. In the days before the conclave, the College of Cardinals will meet daily in what we call the congregation. And more or less, we listen to one another. And I I said, I got to get to know these cardinals. And I listened as the Archbishop of Buenos Aires, Jorge Bergoglio, stood up. And he said to us, he said, we must avoid, here's the term he used, a self-referential church. I said to myself, I wonder what he means by that. Well, it dawned on me and what he was talking about is thanks be to God we had John Paul II and Benedict XVI, who kind of restored a sense of elan and confidence in Catholic life. When John Paul II inherited uh, the chair of Peter from St. Paul VI, who was a great pope too, but the church was really kind of in throes after the implementation of the council, and there was a lack of confidence and conviction. And John Paul II, as you hinted at, restored that interior confidence. Benedict kind of uh, strengthened it with his intellectual acumen. Has Francis strengthened the confidence? What Francis was saying is, thank God we got him. Now we got to move out of thinking from the church within a self-referential church. Thank God, John Paul. Thank God Benedict did that. Now we need a pope who will look out. And Francis, I don't think anybody, even his fiercest critics, and Lord knows we got him, none of them would doubt that he has been successful in looking outside the church, okay? They will wonder if that's been successful, as he certainly ardently hopes it is, and there's thoughtful people that can disagree on that. But nobody denies that his real, what he has brought to the papacy is a desire to look outside. He uses the famous phrases, we got to go to the margins. You look at the cardinals he's appointed. Mother of God, you have to have an atlas when the list comes out to find out the countries that we're from. You look at the countries he's visited, okay? Yeah, but he's all over at these little known countries that people are saying, get me the National Geographic so I can find out about this place he's visiting. Some of these disputes that go on in the church, again, you know, you see the church in Europe, some of them want to go much further. German yep. church yeah. in particular wants yeah. to go much further in kind of liberalizing some of the church's teaching agree. on this. He doesn't seem to have resolved. Again, we've had these two papacies, John Paul II and Benedict XVI, which kind of really sort of reestablished, yeah. if you like, again, let's call it conservative, whatever you want to call it, but the sort of the traditional church yeah. teachings. Francis did come along in it and seemed to sort of promise, suggest the sort of liberalization of this. Let me suggest two things that might help us settle the good observation that you just made. One would be that the churches always go through unsettling periods. You and I are talking on June 28th, the feast of St. Irenaeus, all right? So when I prepared my little homily this morning about Irenaeus, here you're talking about a guy who was in the second century, okay? And the church was riveted with this confusion, what they called Gnosticism. We don't need to get into that, but that seemed to be their version of of secularism. And and everybody was saying, oh my God, how are we going to settle all these issues? We never get all those behind us. There's never an era in the church where there's not some unsettledness and some tension. Number two, we have to remember that Pope Francis is a Jesuit. And the Jesuitical style that has been analyzed uh, ad infinitum, the Jesuitical style is to encourage inquiry. 
You know, a good Jesuit teacher will welcome questions. He'll ask for disagreements. He'll allow other opinions, hoping that in the give... Does Francis do that? Francis doesn't seem particularly... Well, that's another thing they say. For one uh, one one that encourages all this, sometimes people (laughs) that disagree don't quite agree with it. But I think in general, you would see that he... Remember the famous phrase that he used? Everybody said, oh my God. He said, I want to make a mess. And when he meets with groups, he'll say, just go out and do stuff, okay? It sort of reminds me of FDR. Remember his first cabinet meeting? He said, I don't care if they call it left, right, progressive, conservative, just do something and give me some ideas here. So there is that kind of, well, to use liberal in the word of a latitude given to inquiry and experimentation and discussion and debate, which he believes will be refreshing and strengthening of the church. Whether it will or not, people disagree. I want to bring it back to the United States, to the church in America. And indeed, again, what we started out with, the broad sort of spiritual condition of America. We're just over a year from the anniversary of the Dobbs decision by the Supreme Court, the decision that overturned Roe v. Wade, rejected the idea that there is a constitutional right to abortion. And since then, we've seen, as you would expect, a kind of patchwork of abortion laws passed. Again, as a Catholic, as someone who's pro-life, I know you welcome the Dobbs decision, obviously. I think, you know, people who adhere to the church's teaching on abortion obviously welcome it. But what's your sense of where that debate now is, of where the pro-life movement is as a result of Dobbs? In some respects, you know, some would say, given what we've seen, given some of the political outcomes we've seen, in elections and things like that, that actually it seems that a significant majority of Americans perhaps are not willing to embrace the pro-life position. What's your sense a year on from Dobbs of where the debate is, where the pro-life movement is? Well, thanks for asking, because since January 22nd, that sober day, 1973, I've tried my best to be on the front lines of the protection of the civil right to life of the baby in the womb. So I rejoice in the Dobbs decision. Thanks be to God. However, The pro-life movement is at somewhat of a precarious and brittle position now because you got some who are saying, yippee, this is over. Abortion has been outlawed in America. That's not true. The Supreme Court has simply said this is the business of the state, so take it there. So the advocacy, the uh, protection of human life must, must go on. And I think what pro-lifers are deciding is Since 1973, we have put all our resources in the political, the judicial, the election. Now we have to speak about the moral part of abortion, that we're speaking about an innocent, fragile human life. And we need to begin to convert, not a Supreme Court, not a Congress, not a White House. We need to convert the minds and hearts of our people. Similar, Jerry, to what went on in the slavery issue. Now, abortion is very analogous to slavery. Slavery reduced the slave to the property of another person who could decide whether it lives or dies. So does abortion. And that we know that, sadly, that was settled. It had to be settled by war, our civil war, where the conversion of hearts and minds is even a more potent factor. And that goes on to this day. Uh, those questions. And something tells me that's going to be true in the abortion issue. Final question, again, which is in the broader political sphere. We have a Catholic president and we have only the second Catholic president in the history of the United States. We also have Catholics dominate on the Supreme Court as we know that. But I'm wondering, has it made any difference, the fact that Joe Biden is Catholic and is president? I mean, in some respects, the issue we've just been talking about, abortion, he does not sort of, at least politically, in any sort of political sense, seem to align with the church's teaching on abortion on some of these other issues gay rights, transgender, all of those things, he seems to align very much with the left. Does it have any significance at all, the fact that we have a Catholic president for the country, for the church in this country, or indeed for the life of the country? Does it make any difference, the fact that the president is Catholic? Well, in one way, I think it does. I mean, Lord knows his interior life of faith would be beyond me, and we're forbidden by our religion to judge the vitality and sincerity of his own faith. Again, I wonder if we're kind of in the fallout of a misunderstanding of what you and I talked about a little while ago. Namely, there are some that seem to feel that religion can have absolutely no influence on your public life, all right? And I think President Biden 
in some issues would feel that way. Now, there's other issues where there might be climate or immigration where you'd say, hey, he's in line with Catholic principles there. And that, of course, you referred to two Catholic presidents. That, of course, was something John Kennedy felt strongly. You know, more or less, he had to go to Houston to speak to the Baptist Convention, where more or less he said, don't worry, I happen to be a Catholic, but you don't have to worry, it's going to have absolutely no influence on my decisions in the Oval Office. A good Baptist would have bristled at that to say, we wouldn't want a Baptist saying that. We would want them to say, what I glean from the Bible, from natural law, from the teachings of the religion in which I was raised, that will certainly have an influence on me, because we're talking about the realm of conviction and conscience. But we Catholics especially misread it to say, I got to bend over backwards to kind of show that I'm kind of free and independent and that nothing my church teaches is going to have any influence over me. Whether or not that's what President Biden feels, I don't know, but I'm afraid that's kind of an overall problem that we've got. We don't expect that, by the way. America doesn't expect a Jewish senator to say, oh, I better recuse myself from any debate about Israel, because obviously my faith has something to say. Are you kidding? Right. We're, 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 we're encouraged. Of course. We do expect a Catholic to say, oh, I can't let my religion have any effect on me, unless it's a pet issue, unless it's the death penalty. All right. So you had Mario Cuomo, who said, oh, I can't support the death penalty because uh, I'm a Catholic and we're against that. Well, what about abortion? Oh, no, that doesn't make any difference here. So we got kind of this selective approach to things, which I think is detrimental not only to the vitality of our own Catholic faith, but to the American genius. Do you worry about sentiment towards Catholics in this country? I wrote a column a few weeks ago saying that anti-Catholic bigotry was like the only permitted form of bigotry. Thank you for that. And you very kindly, Cardinal, expressed your appreciation for it. Some pushback I got from people was, well, the Catholic Church has kind of inserted itself into politics, yeah. whether it's an abortion or if some they're of these other... they're going to butt in, they res- deserve this. Yeah. It's a rough ball field So that here. whole thing about when the L.A. Dodgers invited oh, yeah. the Sisters yeah, of Perpetual Indulgence, they asked, for, they asked yeah. for it because the church does these things. We can dismiss, we can describe a lot of that, as you and I both agree, as bigotry. But do you worry that maybe the church, especially in the context of the politics of America today, these highly polarized politics that we have in this country, has the church become in danger sort of seen as being on one side of those arguments, do you think? It has. It has. Although we get criticism from both, I get most of my criticism from what you might call conservative Catholics, okay? So you bishops aren't strong enough in condemning things and in excommunicating our president and governor. They're the ones that think we're too weak. On the other side, they're saying the church is sort of butt out of this. Stay in the sacristy. Stay for an hour on Sunday morning and don't bring your faith to the outside world. I'm afraid you're right. So there would be some to say the church is asking for this, but hatred of the church is the oldest bias in American history. I I didn't say that. Arthur Schlesinger did. And they're right. And people seem to be able to get away with. We're not talking about the church above criticism. Please bring it on, okay? We're talking about a vitriol and a lack of civility when it comes to treating the church, the Catholic church, that they would never do to any other group, okay? That's what galls me, and that's what I'm afraid is on the increase. Timothy Cardinal Dolan, Archbishop of New York, thank you very much indeed for joining Free Expression. Thanks for the invite. Well, that's it for Free Expression this week. Thanks very much for joining us. Please do join us again next time. In the meantime, have a great week. <laughs>